and hospitals. I'm Dr. Ann Boric, board certified in internal medicine, and I'm here to keep you up to date on the latest information pertaining to your health and well-being. Welcome to Doc Talk Radio, sponsored by Gilbert Hospital and Florence Hospital at Anthem. Today we have um, an exciting show. We have a lot to cover today. Um, what I want to do is, first of all, uh, introduce you to the guest that we have in the studio, Tony Malay. Welcome. Thank you for Thank being Thank you for here. having me today. You know, I want to read your, your bio because this is really, really impressive. Uh, Tony is the Executive Director of Community Programs and Policy for the Higley Unified School District, which is located in, in Gilbert, Arizona. Tony currently is the administrator over the Community Education Department, the Higley Center for Performing Arts, Community Partnerships, Media Public Relations, Public Policy, and Legislative Affairs, and Emergency Planning and Management. Well, we're going to talk about that. Tony Malay served as Chief of Staff at the Arizona State Capitol for four years from 2003 to 2007. As Chief of Staff at the Treasury Department, Tony worked as the Public Relations Officer the Legislative Affairs Officer, Business Continuity and, and Emergency Coordinator, as well as a logistical manager responsible for construction of the new Treasury Building at the Arizona State Capitol. Wow. Tony was a leader in lobbying for Arizona to be the first state in the U.S. to have laws that prevent government agencies from investing any public funds in companies or countries doing business with terrorists sponsoring countries or countries who contribute to genocide. That's awesome. <laughs> wow, I want to hear about that a little bit as we, as we continue. Tony served as military officer in the United States Army from 1986 to 1994. He graduated from the United States Army Logistics and Infantry Schools. He was honorably discharged from service and currently is the organizer of the Higley Veterans Day celebration for the school district. I was there this year. That's a, that's a neat uh, collaboration between Gilbert and, and Higley. He volunteers by serving on the Veterans Administrative Health Care System Parade Committee. Tony's married to Barbara, and they have five children, six grandchildren. He enjoys hiking, rappelling, and flying remote control helicopters. How cool is that? Well, you just flew in on a helicopter today, so that must have been neat. This one was a real one, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you. You know, Tony, I want to just, um, you know, this is a Doc Talk radio show sponsored by the hospital, Gilbert Hospital, Florence Hospital, and Anthem. And I know there's a partnership between the Higley Unified School District and, and Gilbert, and I want you to just kind of tell us a little bit about that partnership of what's happening. Sure. Um, the Higley Unified School District, we, uh, three years ago, implemented a business model um, to coincide or parallel our education model for um, serving the community. So what that means is, is that we understand as a school district that we have the infrastructure and certain things um, that other people might be able to use. In, in this case, um, we have fields and facilities and um, uh, an IT server room, a brand new server wow. room where we store all of our computer equipment. So um, two years ago when I built uh, the server rooms, about $1.8 million. And Dr. Birdwell and myself, Dr. Birdwell is a superintendent for the school district. She's, she's got a real unique vision for operating a school district like a business rather wow. than an old school district. So we have been progressively um, working towards developing partnerships and relationships with our business community. One of the things that we did is we sought out um, Gilbert Hospital. Uh, we developed that relationship through Amy Jazzcourt and some other folks. Mm -hmm. And um, give her kudos. That's a, that's a credit plug there. So right, commercial hey. break. <laughs> yeah. So she gets her logo up there somewhere. So, um, so we, uh, we approached Gilbert Hospital. And then once we gave the folks at Gilbert Hospital a tour and showed them what we had to offer, they, they were real interested in the data or server room. It's a state-of-the-art server room that, um, that now houses servers and computer equipment for uh, not only the school district, but for Gilbert Hospital. That's great. And so it's a partnership where the hospital gets to um, share a modern facility with all of the security measures that wow. are built into it um, and not have to you know, absorb those costs themselves and build their own server room. That's interesting. So. I didn't know that. That's mm -hmm. really uh, – I know you're involved in some emergency planning and preparedness. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly is that? Uh, the, the school district teamed up with the town of Gilbert, and we have developed a, a, a unique um, coalition called Seven Star. Seven Star involves the school districts located in Tempe, Mesa Public Schools, um, Kyrene School District, Chandler, Higley, Queen Creek, we have a bunch of them in there, and what we do is we, we as school districts, team up with public safety. So Mesa, public uh, safety, fire, police, Chandler, wow. Tempe. And so we all are planning for the day that we hope we don't have to go through. 
Um, there was nothing in place at the time to lock in resources and identify um, what would happen in time of a catastrophe or a disaster. So now hospitals and fire department folks, they, they police, they do this all the time. Mm-hmm. School districts historically haven't. So the very first thing that we did is we got on the mutual aid compact for the state of Arizona. And what that is is that's a collaborative document that um, if there ever were a catastrophe or, or a big disaster, uh, FEMA would come in and take over and do some things, and then you would actually get reimbursed for your participation in it. So what that means is if we um, if we had to use 75 buses and a bunch of facilities mm. as evacuation centers, we would, we would be taken care of. So we have been sharing that, all of our radio frequencies, and right, what we have now is we have hundreds of radios, um, hundreds of buildings in the East Valley, lots of school officials and public safety officials that are now on the same sheet of music wow. in case there is ever that need. So it's a real nice thing. And we want to invite Gilbert Hospital Systems to be a part of that. Wow, that's so. really that's mm-hmm. really amazing. Are, are there like drills that you go through at all, or is it just more just you know setting the foundation right now? No, we, we do drills. In fact, we showed up at uh, Campo Verde High School uh, two years ago with 25 buses and nobody knew what was happening because we don't we don't kind of display the drill what we do is we tell our bus drivers they don't know if it's real or not they have to just jump on a bus and run and so we do real life real time kind of drilling so that's, and we do tabletops as well but. that's great mm-hmm. you know i know that the crisis management and stress mm-hmm. debriefing efforts mm-hmm. you know and just pre- preparing for this show um what is that i know that you had you know expressed that that was one of the talking points what, what exactly is that we have taken uh, critical incidents stress debriefing um, from the past and we've kind of ratcheted it up a little bit to deal with students and parents and community members when we have the loss of a student or a teacher Mm -hmm. so it's not just for the fire or the ambulance or the police guys when they get to a scene and they they see something um, horrific Mm -hmm. so what we've done is we've put we've put binders together and we've hired staff and counselors and if there's ever the loss of life somewhere in the district we provide those services to the students and their families at no charge it's what we feel we have to do to make sure that we maintain it now do all schools do that or is this something that's very unique to the to the higley unified school district a lot of school districts are doing it and a lot of school districts have been doing it for a long time Mm -hmm. and in different parts of the country and the world you can see different variations of that Mm -hmm. Um, but um, i think that higley takes it to a different level because we have um, trained professionals that that's what they do. Got it. So it's not like a teacher who takes on an extra duty. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some new medical studies out looking at the incidence of depression in kids and, mm-hmm. and diabetes in kids and obesity and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, are there any efforts to move into, you know, sh- uh, screening for cholesterol levels or, you know, just kind of moving in more of wellness culture mindset mm-hmm. anything like that, that that's being done or yeah we have um one of our, our our food service provider for the school district is a company called sodexo corporation they're an international company mm-hmm. stem from the marriott corporation and so they provide food service for our school district well as a part of that rfp or that contract we have uh, agreements with them that they have to cut down on certain types of food that are not good they have to put more that's vegetables good. and fruits of the right kind so that we have a balanced um, nutritional program for students um, we get some reimbursement from the federal and state government for it, but it's really never enough to really do the right thing. It's like taking a class. You really mm-hmm. never get the money back for the class. But Exactly. Yeah. But it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Right. right. Yep. No, that's, that's good. Sure. Um, athletic. Let's talk about some athletic safety training because that's really something that I'm interested in. You know, my background is in exercise physiology and, and medicine and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what's going on with training of coaches? Talk, talk to me about that. We have an aggressive um, athletics department director, and his name is um, Art Wagner, and he's finishing up on his doctorate degree, but he's also um, president-elect of the Arizona Interscholastic Association Executive Board of Directors. Wow, okay. Um, It's fortunate to have good people in the district. Dr. Bertel's brought in some good ones, and he's one of the gems. Um, Art Wagner um, has been a champion of the the head injury efforts in the legislature to to make sure that um, collisions between athletes are changed up a little bit so that we don't have the type of head injuries that we're that we're seeing in the nfl and in high school levels um we are also or he also is the the main um person behind the heat uh index so if it's 105 degrees outside and it's a certain percentage of humidity are we running athletes out on those practice fields in the heat and Mm -hmm. driving them into heat stroke or into Mm -hmm. into a physiological condition that's going to require medical attention so Um, so he's be, he's been real active in making sure that we're not running practices from re- week 20 in week three and overworking these athletes. He's been real good about making sure that the coaches and the teachers understand that um, 
that athletics and head injuries and tackling techniques and all those things have to be refined. So it's, it's a neat program, and Art Wagner's leading it. That's so. really neat. Do, are they doing anything in terms of uh, screening for, for concussion, you know, concussion screening, baseline screening? You know, when football players or athletes have a concussion, um, they're assessed at that time. But a lot of times, it's more of a dynamic assessment. Mm -hmm. um, really, it's you know, a snapshot is a CAT scan, right. but it's more dynamics, you know, picking out numbers and eye-finger coordination mm -hmm. and so forth, um, visual coordination. But if you don't have a baseline to compare it to, then you really don't know, mm -hmm. is it significant? Any talk about a baseline screening or I, anything like that? Yeah, I think they know? were looking at, at, at working towards that. Um, I don't know if it was this year or mm -hmm. in the next year, but I know that that was a concern for the coaches and school administrators all over the country because they were the age-old question has come up that okay if your son has been injured in a in a in a in a sport type accident right. are the parents actually going to be honest and come forward with that information and say this is my son he's in the ninth grade now at your high school by the way two years ago he had a head injury on a seventh grade football field right. they're not going to come forward so a lot of the screenings and the the physicals that take place before students are allowed to take the field mm -hmm. a lot of those are not baseline uh, accurate they're just not because the information's right. not being brought forward in, a, mm -hmm. in, in an honest and that's so. why we can do it in an objective way yes you know instead of subjectively just asking the parent or you know for history mm -hmm. there's there's actually ways that we can assess and do the test that would then be done you know on the field or you know in light of, a, of an, an injury um, you know at Gilbert we do a lot of screening we're involved in the mm -hmm. tops procedure the tops program um, you know, doing echoes and EKGs and students and so forth. But I think this is something that we need to really kind of put a buzz in because I think this can be something good, you What's know, that? to get an accurate, comprehensive baseline exam. Absolutely. You know? I think that the, the health care agencies across the country, Gilbert Hospital is, is who's closest to us. Mm -hmm. I think if the, if the hospital's tuned in to the athletic season, tuned into the types of injuries they're coming up with those yeah. in, in those periods of time, I think it's a lot better because when I personally have seen as a former athletic director, um, folks at Gilbert Hospital actually take um, take care in treating a football player that came up there, and I followed him up. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to watch how they carefully cut the jersey off, how they manipulated the spine, how they did mm -hmm. certain things. So um, in some cases, you won't get that. You'll get ERs that are just treating injuries like they're injuries. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Very interesting. It's something that we really should step up to the plate to do, you know, to make ourselves kind of the experts, if you will, you know, and really pull together the ER team and, and the team to, to minister to that. I think that would be great. Wow. Veterans Day. Tell me about that. You know, I was there this past year, and I was actually the video or the, the picture person, the photographer for the hospital. Got some great pictures. It was a fantastic experience. Uh, you're responsible for it? Or I'm the one that created it. Okay. Um, and it all started five years ago when some students at Higley High School were – uh, being a little disrespectful uh, during uh, the national anthem during a lunchtime pep assembly. And so the staff members that were sitting in the gym with their classes were a little um, taken back by that event. So wow. they came to my office and wanted something done. Um, I met with them about a month later and said, I got an idea. Let's just um, let's train all of our kids about what it means to serve in the military. We'll all put our uniforms back on and we'll do a flag folding ceremony, teach them a little How bit about the Constitution. Nice. And what was a $250 event five years ago, um, now it's a $200,000 event with country singers performing and yep. um, helicopters. And falling and out of the you know, parachute jumping and skydivers, skydivers and smoke jumpers. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really a big deal. And now um, it's become a community iconic event. So they, the community demands it, they expect it. And we are really grateful to the Gilbert Hospital System for wanting to be a part of that. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you guys made it possible. You made it possible for Josh Grayson from Nashville to come out and be a part of the event. So we were we were real thankful for that. We're going to put on another good show this year. Really, really neat. And you were you were the one responsible yes. for it. How, congratulations! <laughs> I mean, what a great job, well done. That's awesome. Thank you. You know, you jump out of. Do you, tell me about your hit <laughs> rappelling. What is that? Rappelling, um, jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, when I was in the military, um, I was airborne. So, you know, part of the airborne and air assault school training is they, they teach you how to jump out of perfectly good aircraft. Wow. Well, so I took that to um, a private sector kind of a level. And so what I did is when I was a teacher, I was teaching at-risk kids um, some things like rappelling and zip lining and canoeing. And so I built a program for at-risk kids up in the Aztec School District in northern uh, New Mexico. And so 
I've got all this gear and I, I take my friends out every now and then and my, I hang them off a cliff and, and, and I rappel down with them right next to them. But if you start them off on a low element or maybe a rock that's only about maybe eight feet mm-hmm. you know, high or something, then it's, it eases them into it a little bit better. But it's a great esteem builder because when you're 200 feet off the ground and you're looking straight down and you look at somebody who's belaying the rope or holding onto the rope at the end mm-hmm. – and you tell them to look down and say, that person is holding your life in their hands. It's an esteem changer. And so we used to use it for football players and athletes and gang members. And it's been a real successful program um, in New Mexico, but I just haven't brought it up here right, yet. Right, right. <laughs> Joe, do we have some questions? We do. We have a, a couple so far. Uh, Sue from Gilbert, um, her 16-year-old son had a broken neck a few years ago. He has been through physical therapy and rehab and, and seems to be fine. Uh, moving to Higley School District this uh, next year, will he be able to partake in sports, specifically football? Well, I think that's going to really depend on his, you know, his physician, you know, to make sure that he gets medical clearance uh, from that, you know, from that perspective. It sounds like she said that he's doing okay, um, but I think that at Higley, it sounds like they have a really good athletic training director program, physical therapy program there. Sure, we have a, we have a good program. We have we have trainers that work under um, medical orders from a doctor and so we're real confident and they've been stable in those positions for a long time that's an interesting question that got called in because i actually did break my neck in a car wreck when i was 16 and so and i played football after that and i also joined the military after that so what happened was is i broke one of the little wings off one of the bones in my neck but it wasn't enough to actually cause doctors concern enough to keep me out of sports so um, again, it's it's what uh, it's what you said, Dr. Bork. That if they if the student has cleared uh, medical um, evaluation, then we we don't per, uh, prohibit kids from participating. So, Absolutely. yeah, if his doctor clears him, he's going to be on that field. Gotcha. Thank you, Sue from Gilbert. One, um, th- one thing I want to say, Sue, movement is medicine. So you know, the more movement, the more flexibility. You know, the more the, the stronger the core of the body is, the better. So we don't want to prohibit. Anybody, especially a 16-year-old, from exercising and being active. So that's really important to know. And it's all about the tackling technique, too. So keeping your head up and yeah, that's, yeah. listening to your coaches because that's, the neck doesn't like to be pushed downward. So Good. All right. And the next one, uh, Brian, uh, calling from Higley, has a 12-year-old daughter. She has a heart murmur. Uh, is it going to be a problem for her to be involved in athletics in your district? I can answer that. Just from, um, I don't know about your district, but I can answer the question about the heart murmur. In 12-year-old people, especially, um, you know, kids that are healthy otherwise, it's very common to have what's called a benign murmur. It's an innocent murmur is what we call it. It's it's just a simple murmur of blood flowing across the valves in the heart, um, and that should not prohibit anybody from taking part in any any exercise or, um, you know, formal sport uh, program. However, if she's never had an EKG or an assessment, I think that, you know, she should be seen by her physician just to make sure that a sports physical is done. Um, because there are different ways that murmurs sound. And there's a classic sound of, of, the, of the regular murmur that is um, benign. So if you listen to a heart, it can, if, it's, if it's something to be more concerned about, it, you know, it would give that sound and we would be able to pick something more dangerous up. But for all intents and purposes, nothing to worry about at all. I don't know if you have anything more to add. No, just uh, again, just reiterating that if their physician clears them to uh, practice and play, we we put them we put them out there. Right. So just make sure that your physician sees you, and that's important. Just Mm -hmm. to take a listen to the heart. And Dr. Boric, uh, Brian from Higley wanted to know if you could do a shout out to Nancy Kissinger, who's listening at work with the rest of her staff over there. Nancy Kissinger, welcome. Thank you for (laughs) for tuning in. That's great. (laughs) Thanks for calling in. Good. Any other any other comments yet? You know, let's just talk a, a moment about structural heart disease and murmurs in, in athletes. Um, you know, there, like I said, there are different types of murmurs. The most common is the benign murmur. Mm-hmm. Um, but on occasion, we hear about these kids that, you know, that end up dropping dead on the field. Mm-hmm. And that basically comes from a, a, a lethal rhythm problem. And what happens is that the muscle hypertrophies. It becomes strong. It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it weakens. And when you have a weakened heart muscle, there's a risk of having an irregular electrical impulse through the heart. And, um, and that's what we screen for in these athletes is to make sure that they don't have that classic pathologic murmur, if you will. And then that's why we do the recommended screening EKGs and the top procedure that we talked about um, is we screen like thousands of, of athletes 
uh, young kids to make sure that, you know, that their heart is structurally intact. Um, Some of the parents that have brought that forward to the school district, especially back when I was coaching and an athletic director, they, a lot of these things seem to surface in the hotter months. And I don't know what that is. Or well, if it's just yeah, I mean, what happens is they get dehydrated. <clears throat> you know, and when, when the body's dehydrated, um, the heart rate goes up. I mean, that, it's just a normal physiologic response. When the body's dehydrated, we become tachycardic. The heart compensates. <laughs> and because the heart compensates, it pumps hard, you know, faster, and there's a, there's a risk. And that's what happens, you know. It doesn't give enough time for the heart to fill, and problems can occur. That's why it's so important to keep the electrolytes, keep the potassium, mm -hmm. you know, the magnesium, uh, hydration, all that is very, very important in this heat. A little bit later today, we're going to have more doc talk, and I'm going to talk more about um, skin cancer and exposure to the sun and that kind of stuff. In Arizona, you've got to be very, very careful. Joe, so did you have a comment? You know, I, I may, I, I think maybe this, this question needs to call in live and talk to you okay. because th this seems a little bit uh you might need to know some other things so i'm just going to shoot him a note okay. and see if he wants to call in if he doesn't then we'll we'll, okay. we'll go there you know, let's give the number what is the the call-in number 480-745-1033 and jaeger man out there with your questions I if you want to call in uh the doc may have a couple of questions for you because that's kind of general but you know we'd love to have you call in we'll put you live on the air with dr boric okay good excellent any other anything else right now okay Tony, anything else you want to, you know, kind of talk about in terms of collaboration uh, between the, the school district and the hospital? Well, I think that the, and this, this is, um, it goes back to the, um, to a lot of the work, not only in just sharing the server room at the district and collaborating with other districts and public safety agencies in case of need, um, but there's a lot of efforts that the community just doesn't know about. And... Uh, for example, when you have um, kids that may not receive a bike at Christmas unless the school district does the 100 bikes for 100 kids at Christmas or turkeys for Thanksgiving, see, it's it's back to that model of you may be a school district, but if you're not giving back or paying forward to your community, then you're wrong. And so it's nice to have a governing board and a superintendent and a team of leaders that all believe in the same thing. And so, um, you know, our, our, our relationship with Gilbert Hospital and the healthcare system is just beginning. It's, it's just embryonic at this stage because there's so much more that we're going to do, and it's exciting. The well, potential is huge. It's, it's very huge, wow. absolutely. You know, so. I'm hoping we're going to do the same thing in Florence, you know, mm -hmm. out in, in the Florence district and, and, you know, connect so that we as a hospital can identify ourselves as, as one who reaches out and connects with the school districts and, mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing because I think it's a great model. Yes, yeah, that may, that's neat. Okay, for those of you listening, um, in, in a little bit we're going to transition to an open Q&A session. Um, I have probably four or five different topics that I'm going to talk about, um, but get your questions ready. You know, you can send them in, chat them in, um, call in, and then we'll, we'll fill out the rest of the show with uh, just some topics and, and ask, answering some questions. And, and Jaegerman doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to call in, so okay. we'll just we'll address this question here if that's okay. Uh, let's see. In the last few months, I have been throwing up or puking very red blood. A few times a day, I have been to the... Uh, a few times, I've been to the hospital, and they never found anything. They just send me home, and I've had upper GI tube down my throat, every test possible. I'm really worried. don't know what to do. Not just a little blood. Sometimes it's a cup at a time. Wow. Well, you know, first of all, do we, do we know how old he is or in an age group? Jaeger, how, how old are you? Okay. Well, let me just... Let me, 41. Okay. My first comment is when, when I hear that history, there's something called Mallory Weiss tear. And a Mallory Weiss tear is just a, a small tear in the esophagus that, that occurs when somebody, you know, um, vomits a lot, just with the high intra pressure that occurs with vomiting. Um, you can end up vomiting up blood, and then when somebody looks down there, there's no evidence of pathology. It heals over very, very quickly. So that's my first guess. Um, if, you know, if you've had a scope, which is an endoscopy, to look for an ulcer uh, or any other active bleeding, if that's been normal, then chances are you have what's called a transient um, you know, uh, symptom, I guess. And a transient symptom, the most common cause, is what's called a Mallory Weiss tear. So you may want to write that down and take that to your doc and maybe kind of, you know, bring that out and see what they say about it. You know, this, this show is not intended to really give medical advice. Um, 
but we do, you know, we do give in general, general terms. If it continues, I would absolutely recommend that you go follow up either with your doc or, or in the emergency department. But it, that's what it sounds like to me. And the way to get, get by that is to keep, you know, if you're nauseated, if there's something causing that, to use medications that will help calm the nausea down. Try to decrease coughing and vomiting and that kind of thing because the retching itself is what traumatizes the inside lining of the esophagus. Hmm. He says, is there anything else they've looked for that? No. Well, they, they have looked for that already. That's what he said. Yeah. I mean, other than that, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to know unless, um, you know, a bleeding scan would be the next thing that I would do. And a bleeding scan is a, uh, is a scan. It's a total body scan where you kind of go into it like a scanner and they inject some like radioactive um, material that tags red blood cells. And it allows us to see where there's any bleeding in the body outside of where blood should be. And so that's just a really nice way to, to assess for very small microscopic bleeding, maybe in the colon or in the GI tract or the small intestine. So that would be the other thing, it would be a bleeding scan. So those are, those are my, my suggestions from, from that standpoint. That's a good question, though. Thanks, Jaeger, um, man. In this heat, be very, very careful. Keep yourself hydrated. Um, you know, if you're losing blood and, and, and so forth, um, that can really turn into a, a danger if you're not adequately hydrated because of, of the heat and so forth. Um, so I would be careful. Let's just talk. you have any other questions, Joe? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we just want to kind of segue into um, a couple questions that I had gotten through the week as we were talking on Facebook and on our, law, on our blog. Um, melanoma. I want to just really kind of put that out there. You know, we're head heading into the season, the summer season. In Arizona, boy, it, I mean, it gets, it gets hot. And sun is the number one cause of melanoma. It's the most common skin cancer that there is. Um, and there's different types of skin cancer, but melanoma is the kind that can be um, the most dangerous because it has the potential to spread in the body. There's about 78,000 cases of melanoma diagnosed a year. Um, and that's a, lot, that's a big number. You know, that's, a, that's a big number. More common in people who are fair, who have either blue eyes or green eyes, um, and who have had, interestingly, uh, Tony, this is kind of an interesting thing, but people have had sunburns when they were young. Mm -hmm. That puts them at risk of developing melanoma as an adult. So for th those of you that have kids out there, now is the time to protect them from blistering sunburns because it's the, it's the accumulation of exposed UV light that over time puts us at risk for developing melanoma. Um, and it's, it's a real problem. It, what happens is there's DNA that's unrepaired in the body. And over time, it, it kind of mutates. And it can turn into a malignant type cell in a mole and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, there's something called the ABCDE. You know, the ABCDE is what we look for. When I assess a patient that comes in, you know, when, you know, when I do ambulatory medicine or clinic medicine, um, there's something, it's asymmetry. If you look at a mole, and those of you listening, um, I would encourage everybody to do a skin check and if, if you, you know, to check your skin every month or every other month. Um, if you haven't had a good dermatologic skin exam, now is the time to do it. If a mole looks asymmetric, in other words, if you get a mole and you cut it in half or you, you kind of look at one half, if the one side is not equal to the other side, then that means it's asymmetric. That's a risk. Um, the, if the borders are irregular, you know, a nice, small, smooth, circular, Mole, nothing really to worry about usually. But if it's jagged, if it looks angry, if it looks like a star, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that would be more of a concern. What about if it hurts? If it hurts, that, could be, that can be a sign as well of something that is more than just a benign mole. Um, if there's color changes that occur, if it looks like it's you know, brown and then it turns to more of a purple, more of a black, sometimes even red, you know, melanoma um, a lot of times is asymptomatic. You, it, it doesn't really hurt. That's why it's important to inspect it and look at all of these criteria because that is really important. So we went through the asymmetric, which is A, border, which is B, the color change, which is C, the diameter. Usually the dangerous moles are bigger than six millimeters. If you look at the top of a pencil, the eraser, that's, that's about six millimeters, just kind of a, like, a, like a pencil eraser. Um, and then evolution, meaning that it changes that evolves from looking like one picture to another. Is picture. it bad to pick at them? Absolutely, absolutely, and that's a good question. Constant trauma, by traumatizing the skin, you're actually causing the DNA to mutate and to, to change. 
um, damaging, and that's what sun rays do. The sun damages the skin. And so there's really not a difference between the sun damaging it and you, you know, picking it and damaging it. Um, so you got to be careful with that. What about if it grows big giant hairs out of it? You know, there's, there's something called a, uh, a nevus. That is usually benign. And there's a lot of skin moles that look that way. And Joe's laughing over here. I'm just curious. Because you probably ha- you, you're probably talking about a mole that you probably have on your back. I really don't. Okay. <laughs> but, but that usually, and for the listeners, for moles that have, have that in it, it's usually be more benign. Um, we're talking about life-threatening. Melanoma is absolutely a life-threatening disease. It is the most common cause of cancer in young people. Um, and it leads to death a lot of times. Mm. However, if it's found early... It's curable. So what, 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 let me ask you this question. What, um, if parents are out shopping for no oh, sunscreen yes. or protectants or whatever, what, um, without product SPF. endorsement? Yeah, SPF. You, you want to get SPF greater than 30. Okay. So, you know, they have the 15. Mm-hmm. Um, in this area, in Arizona, we recommend nothing less than SPF 30. And, you know, i got to tell you, a lot of times people will just take it and dab it on. And just, if you, if you take a shot glass... Okay, you should use a shot glass of skin protection a day. The most common problem that happens is that they don't use enough of it. People think that they, you know, just kind of spray it on and just kind of pat it on. That's not enough to protect the skin and the dermis of the the effects, the damaging effects of the sun. And for those of you out there listening, that doesn't mean to drink it. Exactly. You You don't want to drink it, yeah. But just to give you an idea, that's how much. I don't know. How much would that be? A couple ounces? That'd be an ounce or an ounce and a half. An ounce and a half at least of sunscreen a day, not just a dab on the finger. Now, does it matter if you use more, if you're closer, if you're higher in elevation altitude? Because I've heard that if you live in, like the mountainous mm-hmm. areas, and then it's summertime, and you're getting, because you're closer to the sun, you're getting a worse... You probably are, and you don't mm-hmm. feel it. And the problem is, is that you don't feel it. You know, if you go up to Prescott, mm-hmm. or Payson, or, you know, the higher altitudes, um, it's cooler, but the sun exposure, the rays, are still there. And so that's why people, you know, don't think that they're getting it, but yet we're being exposed to it. So you've got to be very, very careful, and, and I think that's really the message that, that we want to get out. Just a couple things that the American Academy of Dermatology recommends, and these are guidelines, to use a broad-spectrum uh, sunscreen, you know, at least, you know, 30 above, on all exposed skin, including the lips and the ears. You know, the top of the ears is a very, very mm-hmm. common place for skin cancer to occur, um, even on cloudy days. So that's where... You know, through the clouds, you can still get that UV that UV sure, uh, yeah. exposure. Mm-hmm. If you're exposed to water, you know, going in a swimming pool, for example, or sweating, you want to use a water-resistant type of a sunscreen. That's very, very important so that it doesn't wash off. Um, shading your eyes. You know, we've got to protect the eyes. You know, melanoma can occur in, in the eye area as well. People don't realize that. But the cutaneous skin, melanoma is the melanic, it's the... It's the cells that give pigment to our body. And the eyes are a pigmented organ. And so a lot of times you can develop a melanoma in the, in the color area of the eye, the iris. So you've got to be careful of that. If you see a, a change in color in your eye, um, I would alert your, your doc you know, or your ophthalmologist. Yeah, Joey, we have a question. We had T call in. Uh, uh, she called in from San Diego. Yes. Want, uh, she has a hiatal hernia, and the doc gave her Prilosec but she still has lots of pain. Any other recommendations, and was that a proper diagnosis that you feel? Well, you know, hiatal hernia is an easy diagnosis to make because it's a a structure. It's not, you can see it. It's, you know what I mean? You can take a picture, you can do an ultrasound, CAT scan, and you can see that there's a herniation of um, the intestines or the stomach up through the diaphragm. That's what a hiatal hernia is. Sometimes it's just the bottom part of the esophagus and the stomach that pushes up. Prilosec is a proton pump inhibitor. It's an acid reducer, and that's a perfect treatment for it. We recommend it all the time in people who have hiatal hernias because they tend to increase acid production in the lining of the, of the stomach. But there's more that needs to be done. And my recommendation in people who have hiatal hernias, not only do you want to use you know, Prilosec or antacids and that kind of thing, but you want to eat smaller, more frequent meals. If you eat a big meal at one time, Think about it. It's going to increase pressure. You know, the, the, the pressure in the stomach is going to go up, and it's going to cause that pressure to push back through, and it's going to make the hiatal hernia. It'll herniate more. So you've got to be very, very careful. You want to elevate the head of the bed. 
you don't want to lie flat because by lying flat, you're increasing the, the possibility of reflux back into the esophagus, causing pain and causing acid reflux. So those are the couple things that I would recommend doing. We've had patients who've needed surgery. Sometimes there's, no matter what you do with a hiatal hernia, it just continues to herniate through, causing pain. Sometimes you need to have surgery to fix that weakened muscle, which is the, the diaphragm, which is the, the muscle that separates the upper chest from below in the intestines and the stomach and so forth. Now, is there a recommended diet for that? I mean, in smaller portions, not stretching the stomach, but is there something that you should be? You know, we recommend <clears throat> acid. There, there are maybe three or four things that increase acid production in the body. Um, we know that yes, caffeine yes. does. So mm -hmm. caffeine, you've got to limit because it stimulates the production of acid in the, in the cells of the stomach. Mm -hmm. Peppermint. Peppermint, interestingly, stimulates the acid production. Um, so you, you want to avoid yeah. peppermint and, and those kinds of things. Uh, spicy type foods, probably not the best because it, it can just make the symptoms worse. Mm -hmm. But beyond yeah. that, you know, just a nice, you know, balanced, high fiber, fruits and vegetable diet is probably the best. Mm -hmm. okay. Interesting, there was a study looking at red meat and red meat and the effects of red meat on diverticulitis. Now, diverticulitis is in the colon, and it's the lining of the, of the muscle, of the lining of the colon that weakens, and it okay. becomes like a little balloon. Red meat has been found to weaken the inner lining muscle of the, of the intestine. And so it would probably make sense to me that if it weakens that muscle, it probably weakens the muscle up in the upper intestine and upper stomach area as well. So I would recommend yeah. avoiding red meat if possible, mm -hmm. um, just based on that study. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. interesting. Okay. Um, you know, before we get that call, I just wanted to finish a, a thought about melanoma. There's, a, uh, there's some interesting studies looking at anti-inflammatory medicines and the protective effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, in preventing skin cancer. Just recently came out looking at, you know, Motrin, ibuprofen, Aleve, um, and how that basically tends to decrease, it's an anti-inflammatory, so it decreases inflammation, where they're finding that there are some people who take that on a regular basis who have less of an incidence of developing melanoma and skin cancers. So that's kind of an interesting thought. Hmm. Yeah. Chris from Seattle uh, took a trip down to Mexico and has had diarrhea for seven months. Wow. Runny, watery diarrhea. And he has been given yogurt, probiotics, and fiber, and nothing is helping. Uh, and it starts two minutes after he's not eating anything. Absolutely. It's, it's classic. And it, he has, um, and without even seeing him, I would bet that he has an infection, some type of a bacterial infection uh, in, his, in his system. And with the history of travel to Mexico or out of the country, um, chances are, you know, there are different parasitic infections that could occur. Um, or bacterial, most likely for seven months or so, I would, I would bet more on a parasitic type infection. You think maybe he ate like a fish with some fly something, larva on there something, or something? Something is in his system. Um, and what I would recommend, if he hasn't had the stool cultures done, that's what needs to be done. Because there's nothing that you're going to do. You're, you can't eat enough yogurt to replenish the good bacteria in the, in the system uh, to treat something like that. And so, uh, Chris, was that his name? Chris. Chris, if you haven't been in to see your doc, I think now is the time to do it. I'm pretty um, sure he has. Okay. And if they haven't done uh, stool cultures, ova, parasite, looking for salmonella, shigella, yersinia, giardia, um, campylobacter. I mean, these are, the, these are the top bacterias and then the ova and parasite that we check for to make sure that there's no infection. So why would they give him the probiotics, the fiber, and the yogurt, thinking maybe his good bacteria was wiped out and trying to reestablish it? Probably. And, you know, without a history of being on antibiotics, it's hard to know. You know, the body doesn't just wipe away bacteria. There's got to be something that we ingest that, that wipes out the bacteria. And the most common cause of that is, a, is an antibiotic. So I have people who come in that have had a sinus infection, you know, or bronchitis. They take an antibiotic. They come, or tooth infection. They come back in two weeks later with severe diarrhea. Well, what happens is the antibiotic that they took wiped out all of the bad bacteria, but it also wiped out all of the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. And then there's an overgrowth of something called Clostridium C. difficile, C. difficile, which is um, pretty common in people who have had antibiotics. But in somebody that has traveled to Mexico with his history, chances are he doesn't have C. diff colitis. This, this is something you know, different than that. It sounds mm -hmm. like it's more of a watery diarrhea that is caused by more of a parasitic or 
you know, one of the other bacteria that I named. So do they ever just do an intravenous therapy on stuff like this? Or they just, or how's... Yeah, well, you know, we treat it with hydration. <clears throat> so we treat it with IV fluids. That's mm -hmm. the number one treatment because as, you know, you can't put in enough that, that comes out. Um, and then we treat with an oral, another antibiotic that is directed toward treating that C. diff. Mm. Um, and it's either vancomycin or flagyl. And those are the two, um, you know, FDA approved treatments for C. diff colitis. So it, it's kind of confusing because, you know, you, you take an antibiotic, it causes the problem, and here I am giving you another antibiotic to treat it. But that's pretty much the treatment. Mm. It's just a different type of an antibiotic. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tough... That's a tough situation. I can't think of anything else that I would recommend doing right now. Does Gilbert Hospital see a lot of people who come back from Rocky Point or these we vacations? Do. Okay. We do. We see a lot of people that come back, um, you know, that have, you know, things like that. You know, and, and I think that the, the good thing, the good news is that we have isolated rooms um, that right from the get-go, you know, we isolate our patients um, and then ask questions next, you know, just because we don't want to cause anything that's going to spread to anybody else or to ourselves you know so we, we're very very cognizant of that and you know because we do it a lot we see it a lot so the hospital is really ready mm -hmm. to be and prepared to take care of those kinds of things now in the military we were we were given tablets and things that we used to make sure the water was safer to drink but mm -hmm. is there something that people should precautions they should take before they go to other countries you know what we recommend a lot of times is, is taking an antibiotic you know cipro or you know something or flans mm -hmm. or something if they do get dysentery mm -hmm. that they can start the treatment even before they come back um just empirically mm -hmm. other than that i don't know of anything the tablets what, what are they they're they're kind of a um, uh, in the old days used to be iodine tablets like iodine yeah, tablets or absolutely. yeah mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that that's being done right now no. i've never prescribed it it's old stuff yeah old school Sometimes the old school still works, you know, but, um, but I've not, I've not Boiling done that. Boiling water. Mm-hmm. Bottled, you, you know, you really don't want to drink water unless you know where it comes from, you right. know, the source of it. That's right. very, very important. Yeah, Joe. Uh, Patrick from Globe. Um, loves coffee, drinks it every time he drinks it, it makes him sick. Is there anything he can do besides changing his Starbucks? You know, when he says sick, I don't know, you know, does it make him nauseated or does it, if he... He, he just said he was very brief. Yeah, you know, what I would think, number one would be if it's caffeinated coffee, and it probably is, if he's getting it from Starbucks, and there's kind of a, you know, an addiction to caffeine, um, chances are he probably has some um, gastroesophageal reflux, and coffee definitely makes that worse. It definitely causes an increased acid production, and you know, within 10 or 15 minutes of, of putting caffeine in the body, it stimulates the gastric cells in the body to produce more acid. And that's probably why he's feeling sick. So I would suggest, number one, to maybe switch to decaf and see how that works, um, you know, or just try to avoid it altogether. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and maybe, uh, maybe you'd mentioned maybe uh, put some milk in it, maybe he's drinking it black. And that's, that could be, but the problem is, is that there's, I mean, that'll calm it and ease it a little bit, but there's still, it's still caffeine. And it's still going to, you know, molecularly cause that physiologic, you know, response in the body. Um, but that's a good thought. You know, sometimes if you do water it down or drink, you know, mild instead of heavy duty bold, you know, maybe that will, that will help. You know, it's hard to know. I wonder if it happens when he drinks tea as well. Or is it just coffee? That's another good question. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I was just thinking, is there, is there something in the coffee that he might be allergic to? You mm -hmm. know, so... Um, you know, hazelnut coffee, or, you know, I mean, there's different types of flavors that sometimes people can be allergic to. So I don't know, but hmm. it's interesting. Any other, any other questions or comments? Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to headaches. Um, I got some questions through the week, and I want to just give a little outline of, of headaches, because I think a lot of people um, don't know that there's a lot of different headaches. You know, we think a headache is a headache is a headache, and that's not true. There are different types. There's tension-type headaches. The tension headaches obviously are in response to stress, tension. You, you know, you're tense in the day, you get a throbbing type headache. You know, after a couple hours it goes away. No problem, really we don't worry about that. It's physiologic and probably everybody has experienced a tension headache at one time or another. Sometimes in the back of the neck, the muscle can tighten up. Mm -hmm. Sinus headaches. You know, headache that can occur when you have sinus congestion, very common. Again, nothing to worry about, very normal. It's a body's response. Cluster headaches are, are more through the day, where you get clustering through the day, more common usually in men, and it's usually on just one side of the head. Hmm. So, you know, if you have a headache that is kind of piercing in the temporal area, and it kind of comes and goes and it clusters in, in times in the day, 
Um, that's what's called a cluster headache. And it's important to know the difference between headaches because we treat them differently. A lot of times we'll treat a cluster headache with something that will help dilate blood vessels to help increase circulation and, you know, and blood flow. I just saw a whole show on cluster headaches. Did you really? A whole hour show. Mm -hmm. They treat it with uh, the common treatment for the really bad cluster headaches are the, um, the shrooms, the ones they grow under the cow pies, mm -hmm. the, the opium-based okay. mushrooms. Because of the, dil the dilatation of blood vessel and blood flow. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting. And then there's the migraine headache. And, mm. you know, migraine is kind of a loose term. We use it loosely, but I, I, I got to tell you that there's different types of migraines. And you can actually have a migraine headache without having a headache. And I have people who come into the hospital who are admitted with what we think is a TIA or a transient ischemic attack. They think that they're having a stroke. Maybe they lose their speaking ability for a few minutes. Their speech just kind of becomes garbled or slurred or they have numbness or tingling, or, or they can't, um, you know, or they can't walk, or they feel weak on one side or the other, what happens is they come in and they think they're having a stroke. Mm -hmm. And all the testing that we do is completely normal. And then when you really talk to the patient, usually they tell me exactly what's going on. We just have to listen for it. Um, but most of the time, they have some type of a scotoma, a scintillating an aura where they said, maybe I was mm -hmm. nauseated yesterday, mm -hmm. or there was a kind of a shiny light that kind of came through, or you know, whatever the case may be. That is classic for migraine. And in those people, then I really, my, my I don't want to say anxiety, but my sense of urgency of, you know, is this patient having a stroke or not, is lessened. Mm -hmm. I feel more confident and, and comfortable that this is probably more of just a migraine headache. Mm -hmm. um, and so those of you listening, just understand that there's different types of migraines. If you, you, know, if you come in with a, a migraine to your doctor, um, give them the whole story. You know, really think about it. Diary. Keeping a diary for headaches is very, very important. You know, women who get headaches with their menstrual cycle, you know, mm. with uh, estrogen changes and hormonal changes, very, very common trigger for migraines. So I think that's pretty important to know. But there's a headache that I get, um, you know, very um, nervous about. When somebody comes in and tells me that their neck is stiff, they have a fever, they have blurred vision, those are the three things that get my attention the quickest. Because until proven otherwise, I've got to be concerned about meningitis. And meningitis is an infection that causes a swelling of the meninges, which is surrounding the brain. And anything having to do with the brain, I get nervous. And I want to make sure that you know, time is of, of essence. And we want to act quickly, and we want to make the diagnosis accurately and quickly. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, in that sense, a lot of times we would do what's called a spinal tap to get fluid, look at it under a microscope, to see is there bacteria, is there infection in the, in the spinal fluid. And if there is, then obviously we would want to treat them with antibiotics um, and not delay that treatment. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, we'll get to a question in a minute. I just want to finish the, the thought of, um, interestingly, m migra or, um, meningitis, there are two different types of meningitis. There's a viral meningitis, which is very, very benign. We oftentimes, you know, you can go home after 24-hour observation. We really don't need to do a whole lot about it. Um, a bacterial meningitis is a little bit more serious. And so that's where we need to do our homework and, and figure out what exactly we're dealing with. In the spring and in the fall are the most common times for viral meningitis. And it's interesting that moms who have kids in daycare can pick up whatever it is, the, the virus that the little kids bring home, and then the mom usually gets the infection and it, and it displays itself in a meningitis picture. So that's a pretty classic scenario. Wow. So just kind of wanting to <laughs> kind of put that out there, just for the different types of headaches that, mm -hmm. that occur. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question, Joe. A question about eczema. Okay. Um, do you recommend uh, bathing in a half cup of bleach and water solution, or what can you recommend? Wow. You know, that's a I, – I, you know, I'm not a dermatologist, so, you know, I really – and as a hospitalist, I don't really see a whole lot of the outpatient types things. Um, I don't know that bleach is recommended to, be, to, to bathe in that in the skin. It can be very caustic uh, and kind of traumatized. I don't know. Unless your doc you know, gave you that advice, I have a hard time you know, recommending that. Eczema is really, there's a triad 
that occurs in the body that um, an eczema is one of them where, the, where there's an autoimmune response going on, where the body's immune system is overactive. Mm -hmm. And eczema is one of the things that occurs where the body kind of attacks its, cell, its own cells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and for that, we oftentimes use topical steroids or things that will kind of calm down the immune system. Right. Bleach, I don't think, is one of them. I, I would not. I would be. A, I would really not recommend doing that unless you specifically talk to your doctor and they know something that that I don't know. Right. Um, but I just would not recommend that. Right. Hey, can we go back to the migraine thing for a yes, second? Yes. Yes. The. Um, I don't get them very often, but when I do get a migraine, um, I have a prescription, so I've saved them. But um, and I go back when I think they're old. But um, my doctor prescribed rail packs to me, and so okay. I get a migraine about once every two or three years. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought it was the light because I have damaged retinas from being in the military. Okay. And so it's a combination, he said. He said it's, it's that, it's what you eat in the morning, it's how your day is if you're stressed. So he said anything can pretty much set off a migraine. So uh, for me, I've just learned to manage it by, okay, go to work, do this, get in a routine, don't mm -hmm. let things get stressful, eat the right foods, and don't stare into the sun. So for me, that, those are that's my... That's what works. That, that was, that's what works for me, so... Mm -hmm. I don't know about this caller, but, but yeah. It's yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, you're right on target. There are, there are triggers for migraines, mm -hmm. and, um, and we need to learn what those triggers are. That's right. why diary is very, very important. Right. And sun is absolutely a trigger. Mm -hmm. You know, bright light can be a trigger. Um, obviously, stress. Mm -hmm. And people who have migraines, they need to know what is the trigger. Chocolate can be a trigger. Caffeine can be a trigger. Mm -hmm. um, right you know, all of those things can be. So we just mm -hmm. need to be careful on how... How maybe to avoid that. Right. Deep breathing, relaxation, Tai Chi, you know, different mm -hmm. things can, can help different people. Right. Yeah. Now, the Relpex, you don't use that on a regular basis. No, no, just okay. whenever I get it, kind yep. of, because mm -hmm. I'll start seeing stars and I can't even drive myself home. So yeah. that's the scotoma. That's exactly, right. that's a very, very classic. Now, what I want to say is that, and I don't know if your doc or if those of you listening that have migraine headaches, but um, there's a, a little bit of a higher incidence of strokes in people who have migraines. Mm -hmm. Because a migraine, by definition, is vasospasm of the blood ves of, the, of the vasculature, mm -hmm. and that's why, you know, it, there's kind of a prodrome. There's a there's a you know preliminary, clinical kind of situation that occurs, and it has to do with blood flow to the brain, um, and so for that purpose, there may be a one or two percent increase in risk of stroke. We oftentimes recommend for people who have recurrent migraines to take a baby aspirin every day. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they ever recommended that for you, but mm -hmm. it's something, and for those of you listening, just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind mm -hmm. um, to, to consider. Even taking maybe a baby aspirin two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to hurt. Mm -hmm. Got a, I think this might be a stat question here. Sissy from Vancouver. Vancouver. Swallowed a rubber ball. Oh, wow. Doing a magic trick this morning about the size of a half dollar. She said it doesn't hurt. Uh, but she wants to know if she should go to the hospital. Um, you know, I would. And, and the reason that I would is that rubber is not easily um, absorbed in the body. Okay, so if you have, well, let me just say this. If you have any symptoms at all, I would definitely go be seen because the potential for an obstruction is, you know, is very high. So, um, you know, hopefully it'll go right through and then, you know, and, and you'll excrete it out. But um, what did he, what, how big was it? It would be a half dollar size? A half dollar size. So, yeah, I mean, if you look at the esophagus, you know, think about the whole GI tract. The esophagus that goes down, there's a sphincter. So that's kind of the gate between the esophagus and the stomach. And then once it moves through, at any turn in the intestine, and i got to tell you, the small intestine, if you lay out the cells of the small intestine, it'll cover a football field. That's how, that's how big the intestine, the small intestine is. It just loops back and forth. Um, I'm not saying on end, I'm talking about the cells, if you lay the cells out microscopically. So there's a lot of surface area there that could potentially become damaged. Um, and so I would be very, very careful. I got to tell you, we had a case not long ago, actually, of somebody that swallowed, um, they were eating an artichoke, actually. And you know the artichoke, the, the well, you, you know, the, the leaf or the prong of it, mm -hmm. he swallowed the whole heart artichoke. And um, after a day, I mean, this guy ended up having a, an obstruction, ended up having surgery, um, had to go in there and remove that artichoke leaf and, and, you know, because it's just not absorbable. The body just can't absorb that. Was that during a magic trick, too? No, no. no. But in this case, this is something I would not take 
take lightly. Sissy, head on down there to the hospital and get in and probably lose that magic uh, magic trick. That's yeah. not a very good one. Yeah, I would be careful. I really, really, mm. really would. You know, there are kids who, you know, would play with crayons and they put crayons in their nose and mm -hmm. it can, you know, you know, I mean, you've got to be careful with foreign bodies in, in the body mm -hmm. because, you know, it could block, it could obstruct and then, and then bad things can happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Know? So that's, that's really a problem. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Nutrition for the eyes. This was a question that came in on, uh, on Facebook. Um, I, I got to tell you that there are a lot of studies now looking at fresh fruits and vegetables, particularly antioxidants, um, in helping to prevent age-related macular degeneration. And age-related macular degeneration is the most common cause of blindness in people as we get older. And so any kind of eye issue, I know you had mentioned something about your eye. Mm -hmm. I encourage, um, you know, nutrition for the eyes because, because there's antioxidants that actually help okay. to We're prevent oxidation, the oxidative stresses being exposed to pollution mm -hmm. and smoke in the you know, air or, you know, eating something that's charcoal that has, you know, um, carcinogens in it and so forth. Mm -hmm. There's a way that the body can rid that, and it's through the antioxidant mechanism. And so, um, basically, age or, or antioxidants reduce the risk of cataracts and macular degeneration in the eye. And I want to just go through. There's something called Occuvite. Occuvite is probably one of the biggest names that are out there. It's a, it's a vitamin that has all of the most important antioxidants and nutrition and, and, and supplements for the eye. And, um, and I'm going to go through each of those different um, beta-carotene. So in an Occuvite, for example, uh, supplement or pill contains all of these things I'm talking about, beta-carotene, flavonoids, lutein, omega-3 fats, selenium, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, and vitamin E. So just briefly, I want to I wanna give some examples of good foods that have that source. So that it, just to kind of make sure that our listeners know that we want to eat balanced food for health. Mm -hmm. You know, food is, is, um, food is medicine. It really, really is. Food is medicine. Beta carotene protects the night blindness and, and dry eyes. And the best sources of, of beta carotene are like carrots, you know, like the orange, the, the different colored sweet potatoes, kale, spanid, uh, spinach, butternut squash. Very, very good source. Flavonoids protect against cataracts and macular degeneration. Uh, the different teas that have flavonoids in them. So mm -hmm. that's very, very good. Citrus fruits, blueberries, cherries. Those are the kind of things that you want to eat that are good for the eyes. Mm -hmm. Lutein and uh, ze uh, it's called zeaxanthin is probably one of the most important supplements for the eyes. Apricots, dried apricots, great source for the eyes. Broccoli, spinach, um, omega-3 fats. We know that's the good fats. That's for the eye. Salmon, you know, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Selenium um, in seafood, you know, brown rice, that's, that's a good source for that. Uh, vitamin A is important for the eyes. So those of you that are listening that have either cataracts or have the potential, if you're, you know, even 55, 60, you know, mm -hmm. and above, and we're getting to that, you know, baby boomer people and, and so forth, think about nutrition for your eyes because it is really very, very important. Yep. Uh, Robert from Phoenix is having a lot of pain in his lower left side of his back. He said he drinks a lot of alcohol. Should he be concerned or should he see if it goes away? Lower, say that again, I'm sorry. Lower left of his back Okay. Um, has sharp pains. You know, it, again, it's Constant hard to say. Constant pain, he said. It's hard to know. You know, a herniated disc is the first thing that you want to make sure of. Is the kidney involved? You know, the kidney, depending on how high or how low it is. Let's just talk about uh, discs for a moment. You know, low back pain. One of the things, you know, probably over 3 million people have low back pain. Very, very common. Um, and usually it's, it's deconditioning. You know, we want to make sure that we strengthen the ab muscles, strengthen the core, because, you know, weakened ab muscles and weakened core tend to put strain on the low back. If there's a leg length discrepancy, if one leg is longer than the other or shorter than the other, um, that tends to, you know, tilt the pelvis and put an unbelievable amount of stress on the low back. So those are a couple of the things that, you know, that need to be looked at. But if somebody has a herniated disc, which is what I would be concerned with, because that would be more of a medical issue. You wouldn't be concerned with the drinking a lot of alcohol? Well, we're going to get to there. We're going to get to that. Um, because that's kind of an incidental. And, I, and I'll, I'll just talk about how alcohol affects the bones and, and so forth and the musculoskeletal system. 
But um, when there's a herniated disc, the things that you want to look at are radiating pain. It's called radiculopathy. And, you know, whether it be radiating down the leg, which would indicate something happening in the lower back, a disc mm -hmm. that is either ruptured or herniated, pressing on the nerve, and you get, you know, shooting pain, electrical pain, uh, deep, intense pain. Mm -hmm. um, that comes from, you know, a herniated disc. Sure. If you get that symptom in the arm, then chances are you have a herniated disc in the neck. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I would be concerned about. So if you have radiating pain, that would be one thing that I would say, yeah, you need to see your doc for. If it's just back pain, achy pain, if you're out of shape, if you're, you know, those kinds of things, um, you drink a lot of alcohol, alcohol tends to deplete the bones um, from calcium. You know, there, you, there's a higher incidence of actually osteopenia in people who drink alcohol. And so, um, you know, you got to be careful with that. I would suggest that you, number one, stop or limit the amount of alcohol intake. Um, and then, you know, kind of go from there and, and see your doc and make sure that x-rays are done. If leg length discrepancy, physical exam, make sure that everything is okay from that standpoint. What about the duration of the pain? What if, I mean, does it matter if the pain is more acute and it's sharp and it comes on or it sits a while or it only happens when he's watching Fox Good News question. or whatever? I mean, yes. Great question. Um, pain that is intermittent and, and associated with movement is more um, musculoskeletal right. in nature. Right. Um, pain at rest. You know, some people that, you know, that have pain, like very, very deep pain at rest could be more neuropathic pain, mm -hmm. more of like a sciatic, um, you know, those kinds of things. Although movement associated with that can be as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would just be very, 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 very careful because, you know, it can turn into something and debilitate, you know, debilitate right. you. Uh, and that's a problem. Okay, actually, we're out of town. We're, we're, we're out of time. Um, that hour went pretty quick. Yeah, it did. Tony, thank you so You're much welcome. for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, we got to get together, absolutely, and, and think about how we can really formally put some programs together at the hospital <coughs> where we can help with the athletes. That would oh, be great. Oh, great. Absolutely. Good. Thanks. That completes Doc Talk. Thank you. We'll see you. We'll see you next week. We actually have a very interesting guest. We have a GI specialist that's going to be here in the studio. One of my colleagues from the hospital, uh, a gastrointestinal specialist, who will be talking about anything in in reference to the stomach, the even the things that we were talking about today, <clears throat> liver. Um, so it'll be a great show. Make sure that you you um, you know listen in. All right, another great episode of Doc Talk Radio, sponsored by Gilbert Hospital and Florence Hospital at Anthem, here every Wednesday at 1 o'clock, so make sure you stay tuned in on Wednesdays. You definitely uh, will learn. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go ahead and send you to some of our sponsors. We appreciate uh, you tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week. This concludes Doc Talk Radio with Dr. Ann Borick. Till next time, I wish you health, wellness, and many blessings. Doc Talk Radio is brought to you by Gilbert Hospital and Florence and Anthem Hospitals. Topics discussed are for informational and not intended to substitute advice from your personal position.